the Japanese have rites and ceremonies so different from those of all other nations. The things they do are beyond imagining. And it may be truly said that Japan is a world the reverse of Europe. To the first Westerners in Japan, it was a mysterious world. It was the fabled Isle of Zipangu that Marco Polo had only heard about. The land of riches that Christopher Columbus set out to find. When the Portuguese arrived in Japan in 1543, they encountered a country embroiled in civil war. Out of this chaos, one samurai warrior would emerge. He would create a regime so strong it endured for over 250 years. Witnesses to this world, both Western observers and Japanese, wrote of these changing times. Theirs is a story of flowering culture, of poetic ritual, and of rigid power struggles. It is the saga of opening trade with Europe and then closing its doors to the West. These are the memoirs of Japan's secret empire. fifth day of the eighth month of the year of the water and the hair there appeared off our western shore a big ship no one knew whence it had come as a buddhist monk later recounted samurai guards were quickly dispatched to warn their master there were strangers on board these ships unlike anyone the japanese had ever seen The local warlord, called a daimyo, summoned these strangers, the first Europeans to ever set foot on Japanese shores. It was the year 1543. When these Portuguese merchants arrived, the daimyo was intrigued by their peculiar, unknown weapons. The Japanese always like novel things, new things, a fad, so to speak. And so they were very, very interested in the Europeans. After he watched the Portuguese shoot down a duck, the daimyo purchased two guns and put his swordsmith to work making copies. Then he asked for shooting lessons. These first Europeans, their guns and their religion, would have unforeseeable consequences. In this same year, a boy was born to a daimyo family. He would be known as Tokugawa Ieyasu. His destiny would be to change Japan forever. As an elite member of the samurai class, the boy inherited a world of tradition. A feudal realm of samurai warriors who ruled by birthright and sword. The son of a daimyo lord, Ieyasu would soon have to give up children's games for the politics of war.
When Ieyasu was still a child, the ruling daimyo demanded that Ieyasu's father send the young boy to him as a hostage, insurance that all orders would be obeyed. When children were taken as hostages, it did not mean prisoners. This was all part of the political negotiation in which uh, alliances had to be formed because no one trusted uh, no one else. So there had to be a guarantee and therefore the hostage was used. As a hostage, the young samurai boy traveled in the style befitting his daimyo rank. He could not know his destiny, nor could he know that he would never see his father again. He would grow up a hostage, his life captive to the turmoil of civil war. The whole of Japan was involved in wars. Treachery was rampant and nobody trusted his neighbor. They would enter into league with one faction and then desert it for another as the winds of fortune blew. Joao Rodriguez, an eyewitness to these perilous times, was one of the first Portuguese to arrive in Japan. He came as a cabin boy of 15 and would soon become a Jesuit missionary. As Portuguese merchants traversed the oceans in search of new ports for trade, Jesuit missionaries accompanied them, searching for souls to save. The Jesuits were young and dedicated, braving the hardships of the dangerous two-year voyage to reach Japan, a country which they considered ripe for conversion. They sent home tantalizing reports of an alien world. Everything is so different and opposite that they are like us in practically nothing. Now all this would not be surprising if they were like so many barbarians. But what astonishes me is that they behave as very prudent and cultured people in all these matters. This is something which I would not dare to affirm if I had not had so much experience among them. The missionaries thought that the Japanese were such a remarkable race their culture was so developed that it was worthwhile writing back to Europe about the culture which they found, the language the Japanese spoke, and a very complex political system without any influence from Christianity, without any influence from Europe. And so I think this is a thing which one should bear in mind, that this was the first time Europeans dealt with Asians on equal terms and not as conquerors and conquered people. Their way of writing is very different from ours because they write from the top of the page down to the bottom. I asked a Japanese why they did not write in our way, and he asked me why we did not write in their way. He explained that as a head of a man is at the top and his feet are at the bottom, so too a man should write from top to bottom. During his more than 30 years in Japan, João Rodriguez became so fluent in Japanese he became known as the interpreter. His work allowed him to observe all levels of society, from the highest daimyo warlords to the lowest Japanese farmer. Every class of person, noble or humble, uses a fan throughout the whole kingdom. People who have business matters and other things which they wish to remember write them down on their fans. 
They are always carrying these fans about in their hands, opening them, shutting them, and looking at them. Nobody would go out into the street without one. The Japanese, Joao Rodriguez observed, regarded the Europeans with equal fascination. They greatly wondered at our big and long noses, thick beards and red or fair hair, and considered all these things as so many defects. They called them the Southern Barbarians, which is not a very flattering term. Their eating habits were rather different. The Japanese were so polite, eating with chopsticks, etc. Whereas in those days, Europeans normally ate with just a knife and uh, with your fingers. And then, of course, the Japanese, most of the Japanese take a bath every day, whereas Europeans, I'm afraid, in those days, went for months and months and months without taking a bath. And to some extent, they deserve the epithet of barbarians. But however they were regarded, the missionaries were determined to stay in Japan. Our only desire was to preach and proclaim the law of the Creator. Even if there were only one Japanese Christian in the whole country, any missionary would spend all his life here just for the sake of that one person. These men were very, very zealous, and the conditions were rather good for the conversion of people to Christianity. When you have bloodshed, revolutions, fighting, battles, death in large numbers, obviously people's thoughts do tend to go to the next life. In little more than 50 years, these missionaries established over 200 Catholic churches, primarily in southern Japan, and converted up to a quarter million Japanese. When a Japanese lord or Japanese daimyo changed his religion, he would bring pressure on his people because he had absolute power of life and death on the people below him. And so you got in a relatively short, short period of time, a large scale conversions. But there was another factor that some of the daimyo, when they became Christian, they had certain considerations of commerce in the back of their mind because where the missionaries went, the Portuguese merchants went. And the Portuguese merchants offered very profitable trade vis-a-vis -vis Japanese. Commerce and religion intertwined. Some Japanese profited while others watched with growing concern, convinced of Christianity's threat to their power. Merchants and missionaries, these early Europeans had set a course which would eventually run into unexpected consequences. of never-ending training, to remain clear-minded in the face of grave danger, to face death matter-of-factly. This is the art of kendo, the way of the sword. Master swordsman taught young samurai the skills of sword fighting and the traditions of a samurai code of honor. This was the education the young Ieyasu would receive, even as a hostage. When you took a hostage in a certain class, they were usually treated very cordially, and they were given education as, just as they would be um, given at home. He probably had a very stoic, Spartan kind of education, taught military skills, martial arts, and Chinese classics, Japanese classics. 
the entire life of Ieyasu was that of patience and forbearance, people say. The young hostage, Tokugawa Ieyasu, would learn what it meant to be a samurai. Adopt a stance with the head erect, neither hanging down nor looking up, nor twisted. Do not roll your eyes nor allow them to blink, but slightly narrow them. Brace your abdomen so that you do not bend at the hips. A legendary swordsman, Miyamoto Musashi, would preserve the way of the samurai in a classic book, The Five Rings. It was a guide to strategy, its philosophy embraced in Japan even to this day. In all forms of strategy, it is necessary to maintain the combat stance in everyday life and to make your everyday stance your combat stance. At age 15, Ieyasu entered manhood and earned the right to carry the two swords of the samurai. The sword was a symbol of the samurai class. Only the samurai were authorized to carry two swords, a large one and a small one. The samurai, with these two swords, ruled over the farmer and the merchant. You're born into being a samurai, it's a responsibility. Amongst the responsibilities of being a samurai was always carrying one sword uh, to use to enact justice. If somebody were rude to you, it was your duty to kill them. But still, no samurai would walk around outside without a sword. And if they were caught without a sword, they could be punished for not upholding their duty. While the samurai class comprised less than 10% of the population, their presence loomed larger than life. Even the missionaries wrote as if the samurai were the whole of society. They carry a sword and dagger both inside and outside the house and lay them at their pillows when they sleep. Never in my life have I met people who rely so much on their arms. They are very warlike and are always involved in wars and thus the ablest man becomes their greatest lord. It was not only the men who swore to uphold this ideal. Samurai women were also trained to protect their family. The most important thing about samurai's daughters or wives uh, was never to forget the honor and the pride as samurai's daughter. In crisis, they had to be prepared to kill themselves rather than be shamed, disgraced by the enemies. The samurai defended his home and family but his true glory came on the battlefield, defending his lord against enemies. The samurai dressed carefully for combat. The finely stitched fabric and leather appeared elegant, even fragile. Unseen were the tightly woven plates of steel. Much like his protective armor, a warrior's refined appearance concealed his impenetrable inner core. This ethic, preserved in writings of the samurai, would prepare the warrior to meet life and death with honor. A samurai would wash himself with cold water every morning, scent the shaven top of his head and hair with incense to make himself presentable. He was ready to be killed in battle at any moment. Cherry blossoms are often compared to the samurai, 
They are a beautiful sight, like the warrior in his shiny armor. But it takes only one big storm for the petals to fall to the ground, just like the warrior in battle. For samurai, as important as knowing how to kill was knowing how and when to die. In the battlefield especially, your last moment of life, you have to show your control. The controlling your body, controlling your destiny, fate, is the vindication, indication of your internal strength. So it's the last moment that you have to stage your death. Seppuku, or harakiri, is the ritual of suicide as practiced by samurai. A samurai warrior carried two swords on his hip, a long one and a short one. The short sword was for cutting open his abdomen. Why would a samurai cut open his abdomen? Well, Japanese, especially samurai, believe that the heart was in the belly. They believe that whether their heart was pure or impure would be revealed when they disemboweled themselves. From the death poem to the final thrust of the dagger, seppuku is a ceremonial ritual of suicide ensuring an honorable death. Joao Rodriguez wrote of a man who committed the ritual of seppuku. The samurai, dressed in the customary white kimono, solemnly and with great dignity, mounted a raised platform. Then, in a loud voice, he told them to watch him carefully as he cut himself open. He seated himself and wrote his will slowly and calmly, asking his lord to look after his son and family, for he was going to die on account of his honor. He bade farewell, and then in front of them all, he fearlessly cut his belly. And so, he died. This sort of thing often happens. There is timing in everything. Timing in strategy cannot be mastered without a great deal of practice. There is timing in the whole life of the warrior, in his thriving and declining, in his harmony and accord. These are the enduring principles which guided the life of the samurai warrior. For Tokugawa Ieyasu, patient strategizing would become his most powerful weapon. He was now of age, 18 years old, and married with two children. But he was still a hostage of the ruling daimyo warlord. As time passed, Ieyasu strengthened his skills as a warrior, fighting alongside his daimyo master. When his master was killed in battle, Ieyasu was finally free to determine his own destiny. Ieyasu was put in a position to have to make a decision at some point, whether to go along with the hostess family, but at all times he never forgot his ambition to go back to his original castle and to regain all the territory that his father's family had and to expand that and to go back to his retainers who were faithfully waiting for him.
Ieyasu reclaimed his title as an independent lord, a daimyo. He returned to his family estate. He could now fight on his own terms for his own people. I fought against my enemies solely in order that I might take my revenge on my father's adversaries. Because I was convinced of the rightness of my intention to help the people and bring peace to the land. The years of captivity had honed his discipline. According to his samurai training, he now carefully plotted his strategy. In a crucial move, Ieyasu allied himself with the man who killed his daimyo master, Oda Nobunaga. Nobunaga had become the most powerful warlord in Japan, feared and ruthless. The missionary, Joao Rodriguez, documented Nobunaga's campaign to unify Japan. Nobunaga was the first to begin cutting through the thick forest of wars and discord in Japan. He subdued about half the country and fear of him made the remaining parts ready to obey him in anything. In the Battle of Nagashino, Nobunaga armed 3,000 of his foot soldiers, three ranks deep. As 10,000 enemy warriors charged, Nobunaga's musketeers fired in succession, decimating the opposing army. Nobunaga's innovations in the use of firearms completely changes the face of samurai warfare. The old idea was where you would have two samurai meet on the field of battle. They would shout out their names and their lineages, where they were from. Uh, sometimes one would ride out in front of all these troops and, and challenge someone to, to come and defeat him. So it was, it was very manly. It was imbued with the ideal of valor. Now you have faceless ranks of samurai shooting other faceless ranks of samurai. Nobunaga continued to amass power until one night treachery within his inner circle caught him off guard. A missionary was nearby. Some Christians came just as I was vesting to say an early mass and told me to wait because there was a commotion in front of the palace. We at once began to hear musket shots and see flames. We learned that it had not been a brawl, but that one of his generals had turned traitor. Some say he cut his belly, while others believe that he set fire to the palace and perished in the flames. What we do know, however, is that of this man, who made everyone tremble not only at the sound of his voice, but at the mention of his name, there did not remain even a small hair which was not reduced to dust and ashes. As the flames burned, Nobunaga's loyal general, Toyotomi Hideyoshi, seized the moment. Hideyoshi immediately springs into action, murdering the murderer of his own lord, which then gives him the, the right, in essence, to claim leadership of Nobunaga's vast uh, coalition of armies. Ieyasu watched from a distance. Would he subordinate himself to Hideyoshi's command? Or was it time to fight for control?
Nobunaga, Hideyoshi, and Tokugawa Ieyasu. These were the men who would bring an end to the brutal civil wars. They would go down in history as the unifiers. There's a story in Japanese that explains um, the character of the three unifiers. And Nobunaga, Hideyoshi, and Ieyasu are watching a cuckoo bird waiting for it to sing. But the bird doesn't sing. And Nobunaga says, little bird, if you don't sing, I will kill you. And Hideyoshi says, little bird, if you don't sing, I'll make you sing. And Ieyasu says, little bird, if you don't sing, I'll wait for you to sing. And Ieyasu is a, a patient strategist who will wait for things to go his way, and then he'll act. After Nobunaga's death, Ieyasu and Hideyoshi faced off in a measured game of strategy, each in his own way trying to outsmart the other. As a military leader, Ieyasu was a courageous man who never hesitated in battle. However, though he was brave, he was also cautious. One famous story, Ieyasu was known as an excellent horseman. One day he and his troops had to cross a very narrow bridge over a raging river. Everyone was watching to see how the great Ieyasu would ride his horse over this dangerous bridge. To his men's surprise, Ieyasu dismounted, took the horse's reins in his hands and carefully led the horse over the bridge to the other side of the river. That's how vigilant he was. I believe this kind of caution helped him to be victorious in battle. While Ieyasu practiced restraint and careful strategizing, Hideyoshi acted quickly and decisively. Hideyoshi was from peasant stock. The son of a lowly foot soldier, he worked his way up through the ranks. Hideyoshi became known as a brilliant general, and he held the same grand vision of himself. When my mother conceived me, she was given a miraculous omen. On the very night that I was born, the room was suddenly aglow with sunlight, thus changing night to day. Finally, they divined, the child whose birth was attended by these miracles was destined to become a man of unusual attainments. This prediction is fulfilled in me. Shortly after Hideyoshi took control, Ieyasu challenged him. But Ieyasu soon realized there was more to be gained as Hideyoshi's ally than as his enemy. Hideyoshi rewarded Ieyasu for his loyalty with a vast domain of land and ordered him to make his headquarters in the remote fishing village of Edo, 300 miles east of Hideyoshi's castle in Osaka. Some might have thought the gift an insult, but in Edo, the village that would later become Tokyo, Ieyasu busied his troops building a massive five-story castle fortification. Within the walls of the city of Osaka, Hideyoshi was consumed with fortifying his own castle. Reputed to be the most impregnable fortress of its time, it was also one of the most ostentatious. Osaka Castle had a strategic location close to the Emperor's Palace in nearby Kyoto. For centuries, the emperor had remained a ruler in name only, ignored by those who truly held power. He whiled away his days with court gossip, calligraphy, and poetry. By Ieyasu's time, the court is still powerless, but it is only the court 
which can appoint the shogun. So in the ultimate symbolic sense, the court is still the arbiter of final resort. That's why all the warlords are aiming for Kyoto. You have to get the emperor to recognize that you're the most powerful of all of the combatants on the field of battle. Hideyoshi curried the emperor's favor, inviting him to no plays and musical performances. But the emperor would not grant this warrior of peasant stock the title of shogun. Ieyasu never relinquished his desire for power. He offered the emperor more than invitations. He arranged the marriage of one of his granddaughters to the emperor's son. All of the lords in Japan used family to cement political alliances. You would marry off daughters or marry off sons. What Ieyasu did in particular was have an abundance of sons that he could use. He could set them up to support his nascent government. He could set them up as independent military lords that he could then call upon um, for help. In contrast, Ieyasu's rival Hideyoshi failed to produce a male heir. Finally, he adopted a nephew and groomed him as his successor. Then, at 60 years of age, Hideyoshi finally fathered a son of his own. He called him Hideyori, and he was the jewel of his life. Hideyoshi's thoughts now turned to the safety and survival of his young son. I cannot describe the endless tedium as if I were guarding an empty house when Hideyori is not here with me. I say again, strictly order that all be vigilant against fire. Each night have someone make the rounds of the rooms two or three times. As Hideyoshi obsessed over his own son, his adopted son, now an adult, was in peril. It's clear that by the end of his life, Hideyoshi was acting more and more erratically he became increasingly cruel, if not sadistic. Then when he finally, uh, in his final years, produced an heir of his own, he ordered this adult male who had been his heir to commit suicide. Hideyoshi then ordered his adopted son's entire family put to death. A missionary recounted. They were drawn along the streets in the carts, the open view of the world, 31 ladies and gentlewomen, with the two sons and one daughter of his adopted son, the oldest of whom was not more than five years old. All their bodies were thrown into a pit, over which was built a little chapel with a tomb in it, with this inscription, the tomb of the traitors. Soon after, Hideyoshi's health began to fail. He wrote his death poem. Ah, as the dew I fall, as the dew I vanish, even Osaka Fortress is a dream within a dream. Hideyoshi then called Ieyasu and four of the most powerful daimyo to his deathbed. He appointed them legal protectors of his five-year-old son, Hideyori his heir and the future ruler of Japan. Ieyasu pledged to protect the boy with his own life, a pledge that would become very difficult to keep. It is said that war is a curse. It is resorted to only when it is inevitable. However, in time of peace, do not forget the possibility of disturbances. Ieyasu was on guard. Those daimyo who feared his growing power began to plot against him. Ieyasu's territory now extended throughout most of Japan. 
He was determined to maintain his holdings and expand his base of power. One of Ieyasu's nicknames is the Old Badger, and it reflects his craftiness, as well as his famed ability to wait. And he waits until after Hideyoshi is dead, until he has a clear preponderance of power, and then makes his move uh, to become the dominant military leader in Japan. Ieyasu mobilized his troops. He sent one division to Ogaki Castle, where his enemies were gathering. When the battle began, women and children rushed to safety. Ieyasu sent a large force to lay siege to the castle. And they fought day and night. One of the young girls at the castle later told her family of the terrifying experience. Mothers, concubines, and daughters all stayed in the tower and cast bullets. There was panic. A bullet struck my younger brother, killed him on the spot. It was a cruel sight. Indeed, it was. We felt as if we should die. There was nothing but fear and horror left. As the battle wore on, heads of slain warriors were brought to the castle to be prepared for the ritual presentation to the victor. It was believed that even in death, the samurai should be viewed as a worthy opponent. Those people who are in the castle would wash the heads and they would put some cosmetics on the face of the dead corpses because they were proof of having killed someone important. That was part of the very small part of uh, what they did, which is inconceivable to, you know, us modern people, modern women. All the decapitated heads were brought into the tower. We weren't a bit afraid of the heads and used to sleep in the midst of the nasty smell of bloody heads. Victorious at Ogaki Castle, Ieyasu's troops now pursued the rebellious daimyo and their armies. They faced off in a narrow valley just west of the village of Sekigahara. This would be the battle that changed the course of Japanese history. Ieyasu set up his command post atop a hill overlooking the valley, waiting through the night for the rest of his armies to arrive. At dawn, Ieyasu's attendant physician hastily noted in his journal, Slight rain, dense fog in the mountain valley, can't see, barely made out enemy banners. On horseback, Lord Ieyasu made out their positions. Estimate distance at two and a half miles. Ieyasu was outnumbered, with only 50,000 troops challenging his enemies 80,000. He waited for his son to arrive with reinforcements. But at eight in the morning, the fog suddenly lifted, and the two opposing armies found themselves within striking distance. Ieyasu could wait no more. Rallying his troops, it was said he sent them forward with his famous battle cry. There are only two ways to come back from the battlefield. With the head of an enemy, or without your own. Ieyasu watched as his troops faced what seemed insurmountable odds. Then, suddenly, the tide turned. Several enemy daimyo and their armies, convinced of Ieyasu's ultimate victory, defected and joined Ieyasu's forces. 
By 2 p.m., Ieyasu's troops had defeated the rebellious army. Tokugawa's victory at Sekigahara brought an end to the warring states and signaled the beginning of a new era. That's the significance of the Battle of Sekigahara. In recognition of Ieyasu's power, the emperor awarded him the title of Shogun, the barbarian subduing generalissimo. Tokugawa Ieyasu now had the authority to rule Japan in all military matters. He ruled unchallenged, but always there was the specter of Hideyoshi's young son Hideori growing up in Osaka Castle. Ieyasu had sworn with his life to protect the boy, the boy who could someday lay claim to all Ieyasu had won. As the young boy Hideyori approached manhood, a daimyo warned, Although he is Hideyoshi's heir, Ieyasu would never let him rule Japan. Sooner or later, some ambitious character will foment rebellion in his name. And even if Hideyori knows nothing about it, he will be blamed and forced to commit suicide to the grief of Hideyoshi's ghost. Now, the Tokugawa had no divine right to rule Japan. They ruled Japan because they were the most powerful, they had the most money, they had the most soldiers, but they had no divine right. And there were many other powerful daimyo, especially in the West, the Christian daimyo. And so if there were any philosophy, any political movement that would bring these daimyo together as a coalition against the Tokugawa family, that was very dangerous. Tokugawa Ieyasu tolerated no dissent. He expelled many of the foreign missionaries, including João Rodriguez. Ieyasu wanted to clear the board of all these foreign influences which were just muddying the waters, making life more complicated. He even ordered all Christian activity among the Japanese halted. But still he faced the only true threat to his power, the young Hideori. By the time he reaches adulthood, Hideyori can no longer be ignored by Ieyasu. He's a threat simply because he exists. He is the legitimate heir of Hideyoshi. Um, Ieyasu is supposed to be supporting him until he, until he becomes an adult, and he poses an intrinsic threat to the legitimacy of the Tokugawa shogunate. Ieyasu came to but one conclusion. He could no longer honor his pledge to a dead ally to protect his son. Ieyasu decided to go into battle once more. It was obviously going to be another showdown. And the many, many, many samurai, in their thousands, and these were hard-bitten warriors, they still owed loyalty to Hideyoshi's family. And of course, they owed just as much loyalty to his son. So they gathered in Osaka Castle, and Osaka Castle was a very, very, very strong castle. It was considered impregnable. In the winter of 1614, Ieyasu accused Hideyori of subversion and ordered his troops to advance against Osaka Castle. Hideyori's supporters, nearly 100,000, held strong. Ieyasu retaliated with a devious plan. He sent a woman samurai to negotiate a truce with Hideyori's mother.
Ieyasu offered a safe haven for Hideori's garrison if in return he agreed not to mount further rebellion against Ieyasu's rule. To prove his intentions, Ieyasu signed the pledge in blood. Hideori's mother convinced her son to accept the offer. Ieyasu's ploy had worked. As soon as the fighting stopped, Ieyasu began to fill in the moats of Osaka Castle, the deep moats. And the people in the Osaka Castle protested a lot. That was not in the agreement, but <laughs> that didn't matter. They filled in the moats. And once the moats were filled in, then Ieyasu's troops could storm into the castle. And there was a dreadful slaughter. Thousands of defeated soldiers, women, and children fled the castle compound. A European merchant recorded the event in his journal. We had news today that Ieyasu hath taken the fortress of Osaka and overthrown the forces of Hideyori. They say the taking of this fortress hath cost about 100,000 lives and that no dead man of account is found with his head on, but all cut off. Ieyasu's army set the castle on fire. As the flames raged around him, Hideyori refused to surrender and was left with no other option. He committed seppuku. There's one big problem with killing Hideori, however, and that's that Ieyasu was supposed to be his supporter. I mean, it's a very realistic, cold-blooded strategy, um, but he wanted to establish a dynasty that would last through the ages. There is reason to believe that Ieyasu genuinely regretted having to kill the son of his former lord. Ieyasu is said to have paid penance by writing the name of the Buddha 10,000 times on scrolls of parchment. Tokugawa Ieyasu had wiped out the last threats to his power, or so it seemed. But not everyone was under his control. There were the Western traders who he valued but mistrusted and the Christians, who he considered a threat. Tokugawa Ieyasu had won the wars. His struggle to control the future of Japan had just begun.
In the early 17th century, the ruler of Japan, the Shogun, was told this story. One day, the king of the Portuguese said to his council, Far to the east lies a country called Japan, and it abounds in gold and silver. Why should not that land be added to my domains? The best way to make ourselves masters of the land is by means of our religion. And then send in the army. The Shogun, Tokugawa Ieyasu, and his legions of samurai warriors were undaunted by stories of foreign invaders. He was a strong leader and had brought peace to the war-torn nation. Yet foreign dangers and internal unrest remained a threat. As Japan deferred to the will of the Shogun, eyewitnesses wrote of these remarkable times. These are their memoirs of Japan's secret empire. After we'd been in Japan five or six days, came a Portugal Jesuit who reported that we were pirates. We looked always that we should be set upon crosses, which is the execution of this land. I looked every day to die. Rescued from the sea and imprisoned, William Adams, the first Englishman in Japan, had good reason for concern. It was the year 1600, and Portuguese Catholics had long held a monopoly on trade in Japan. At the time William Adams arrived, there had been religious wars in Europe, and the Catholic missionaries were not at all happy when they heard that an Englishman and an English Protestant had been washed up in Japan. The most powerful warlord in Japan, Tokugawa Ieyasu, commanded Adams to his castle. Rather than ordering his execution, he wanted to know more about this stranger. The summons was highly unusual, as only the highest ranking officials were ever received by the great man himself. The ruler demanded of me of what land I was and what moved us to come to his land, being so far off. I showed him the name of our country and that our land desired friendship. It appeared that Ieyasu was interested in more than friendship. He asked whether our country has wars. I answered him, yea, with the Spaniards and Portugals. He asked me diverse questions of my religion and what way we came to the country. From one thing to another, I abode with him till midnight. As the meeting came to an end, Adams dared to make a parting request on behalf of his Dutch employers. I desired that we might have trade with your country, the same as the Portugals and Spaniards. To Ieyasu, this was welcome news. Ieyasu valued trade with the Portuguese and Spanish merchants, but was wary of their Catholic missionaries who preached obedience to a god more powerful than he. To avoid those he considered a threat to his own authority, Ieyasu wanted his own fleet of trading ships. Adams had the skills he needed.
The English pilot had apprenticed as a shipwright. Ieyasu asked him to build two ships capable of navigating the open seas. I answered that I was no carpenter and had no knowledge thereof. Well, do your endeavor, saith he. If it be not good, it is no matter. You can't deny that William Adams did have a certain amount of influence when he was told to build these two ships. They were the first foreign ships, first European ships to be built in Japan. They were built with Japanese workers, of course, under his supervision. And then afterwards they sailed to Mexico and they sailed back quite safely. Ieyasu now had the leverage he desired. When the Catholic missionaries continued to gain converts and create problems, he expelled them. Life was complicated enough without these pesky foreigners uh, interfering. And so that probably was the reason why he did not want Christians in Japan. Ieyasu replaced his Catholic interpreter with William Adams, who had been quick to learn Japanese. He was a Protestant, of course. Ieyasu knew that he had no interest in helping the missionaries, and so he was rather a valuable man to have around. Ieyasu still wanted to trade with the West, but on his own terms. Adams convinced Ieyasu that the Protestants did not want to convert his people. Ieyasu soon made him his commercial agent, and Adams negotiated especially favorable terms for the growing Dutch East India Company. The Hollanders be now settled, and I have got them trading privileges as the Spaniards and Portugals could never get in their 50 years in Japan. Adams married and settled down into Japanese life. He adopted Japanese dress and was awarded the right to wear the two swords of the samurai. And he was given an estate with about 70 or 80 servants, which is pretty good, far better than his standard of living in England would have been, of course. And I think towards the end, he lost his desire to go back to England because he knew he would just be a working class man in England where back in Japan, he has 80 servants to wait and handle foot on him. It was possible that Adams visited Ieyasu at his tea house for intimate conversation away from the politics of the court. The tea ceremony was much admired by a Western observer. The guests open the gate, walk along the path through the wood up to the tea house, quietly contemplating everything they see. They remove their fans and daggers and deposit them in a the kind of cupboard placed there outside for that purpose. If Adams and Ieyasu had private political discussions, the tea house was also a retreat where they could replenish their souls. This gathering for tea and conversation is not intended for lengthy talk, but rather to contemplate within their souls, with all peace and modesty, the things that they see there, and thus, through their own efforts, to understand the mysteries locked therein. For Ieyasu, unsettling foreign influences could jeopardize the peace he worked so hard to forge. 
But the biggest challenge would be to maintain control of the 260 fiercely independent warlords and their formidable samurai armies. Tokugawa Ieyasu became shogun in 1603 and united Japan after generations of civil war. All of the great lords had been fighting uh, for a century. They were tired of fighting. They wanted to secure their own positions. But as a court chronicler documented, the task ahead would not be easy. Although he had conquered the country on horseback, being a man of wisdom, he fully appreciated the impossibility of governing the country on horseback. He was interested only in discovering the key to government, how to govern oneself, the people, and the country. What made Ieyasu superior as a leader was that he surrounded himself with capable people who believed in him. There's a story about a low-ranking samurai who asked to meet with him. Ieyasu listened attentively. After the man left, a higher-ranking lord said to Ieyasu, What a waste of your time! Ieyasu replied, It took great courage for that man to approach me. If I didn't listen, he would never come again. Peace would not be secured by leadership alone. Ieyasu had to curb the power of the daimyo, the feudal lords. These lords are building enormous territorial, centralized domains. What the feudal lords are trying to do is essentially control everything and everybody within their territories. They control all the fighting men, they control all the peasants, they control all the resources. Ieyasu allowed the daimyo to rule their own domains, but he prohibited them from doing anything that might enhance their power or status relative to each other. In Tokugawa, Japan, a daimyo was restricted to only one castle, and to enlarge it, he had to receive permission. A new ship? Ask the shogun. Arrange a new alliance through marriage? Only if the shogun approved. Ieyasu would maintain the peace through this ordered control, and it extended through all levels of society. The Japan that Ieyasu fashioned was built on the ancient teachings of Confucianism. Obey the traditions of hierarchy and respect authority. A Japan in keeping with the samurai traditions. It was a rigid society with lots of rules and regulations. Everybody must know their place in society and stick to it. That was a theory. It didn't always work out in practice, of course, but that at least was the theory. All samurai were members of the elite class, whether he be a daimyo warlord or a lowly foot soldier. Next in line were the farmers, then the artisans. At the very bottom were the tradesmen, considered the parasites of society. The Tokugawa shogunate would issue many rules to control and maintain the rigid class structure from what you could eat to what you must wear. Lords and vassals, superiors and inferiors, must observe what is proper within their position in life. Without authorization, no retainer may wear fine white damask, white wadded silk garments, purple silk kimonos, purple silk linings, and kimono sleeves which bear no family crest. The rules and regulations kept everyone in their place, but for the daimyo at least, there were still ways to earn special privileges. Ieyasu decreed that the lords must help build his castle and the surrounding city of Edo. 
The construction became a grand competition as each daimyo vied for the shogun's favor. Soon they transformed the small castle and backwater village of Edo into a magnificent domain. The city later known as Tokyo. The streets are far broader, longer and straighter than the streets of Spain. They are kept so clean that you may well think that nobody ever walks along them. The emerging splendors of Edo were recorded by Rodrigo de Vivero y Velasco, the governor of the Philippines, who had been shipwrecked off the coast of Japan. He spent several months in the capital as a guest of the shogun. What makes this man interesting is that he wrote a report about Japan after he left Japan. And he was a very discerning man. He saw various aspects of Japanese life which other people had not seen. The people live in particular streets according to their trade and station. One street, for example, is reserved for carpenters. In other streets, there are cobblers, blacksmiths, tailors, and traders. The nobles and people of quality live in the streets and districts quite different from the rest of the town. And no commoner or person of the lower classes mixes with them. Those daimyo who had gained most favor lived closest to the castle and were granted more audiences with the great ruler himself. While Vivero y Velasco was in the castle being received in audience by Ieyasu, he saw a powerful daimyo come into the castle to pay homage to Ieyasu. There entered one of the greatest nobles of Japan, whose rank was evident from the gifts he brought. Bars of silver and gold, silk robes. All this was first placed on some tables, but I do not believe the ruler even looked at it. A hundred paces from the throne, the daimyo prostrated himself, bowing his head so low that it looked as if he wanted to kiss the ground. Nobody said a word to him, nor did he raise his eyes towards the ruler. And then finally somebody <laughs> clapped, end of, end of audience. Not a word had been said, end of audience. And he goes out backwards on his knees. And Rodrigo Velasco was very much impressed by what he had seen, because he realized the power Ieyasu had. Here was a powerful daimyo who had power of life and death in his own region. But when he comes to pay tribute to the shogun, what a lowly position he adopts. The great ruler had realized his vision. All of Japan was under his control. At 72, he was still remarkably vigorous. Then, on one of his regular hawking expeditions, he fell seriously ill. As he lay dying, he planned the details of his funeral. It would be a simple ceremony, his ashes taken to the top of a mountain overlooking the land where he so often went with his hawks. Here, he felt, his spirit could soar over his beloved land, holding the realm together. Ieyasu had carefully forged his well-ordered society. He would not leave the future of Japan to whim. He called his family to his side. He told his children and grandchildren who were gathered around, because you are my descendants, you will become shogun. As shogun, it is important that you rule the country for the benefit of the people, or you will be punished by heaven. As shogun, you must govern for the good of the country. 
This world does not belong to the Tokugawas and cannot be ruled just to satisfy your whims. Among the family members was a young grandson destined to become Shogun. The child, Iemitsu, would grow up determined to carry on in the footsteps of his famous grandfather. Iemitsu, the third Shogun, would keep Japan under Tokugawa rule, using any means necessary. The third Tokugawa shogun, Iemitsu, worshipped his late grandfather. He had numerous mystical experiences that whenever he got sick, Ieyasu would appear in his dream and he would wake up feeling better the next morning. So his respect for Ieyasu transformed into worship. Iemitsu always carried a charm containing a piece of paper saying to live according to the way his grandfather would have lived. But though Iemitsu tried to emulate his grandfather, his tactics were much more severe. It was reported after he became shogun, Iemitsu summoned the daimyo to his palace. The lords waited all day in the cold without food or shelter. They began to fear for their lives. Until at last, they were called into Iemitsu's inner sanctum where he delivered his ultimatum. I have been in the position of a superior and a master from my birth. I shall henceforth treat all daimyo as my subjects. Those of you who may disobey me may quickly return to your provinces, repair your castles, and prepare for arms. I shall act accordingly. Iemitsu is a fascinating shogun. He's the first shogun who doesn't lead troops in battle. He had not proved himself on the battlefield. He did not have his own men who came with him into office when he became shogun. Iemitsu inherited a nation at peace. Yet he would rule with an iron hand. He listened to few and spared no one. He would not tolerate competition, not even sibling rivalry. He ordered his younger brother to commit suicide. The Tokugawa shogunate under his rule acts much more capriciously towards lords that uh, disobey their orders or flout any of the rules and regulations which bound them. A European merchant who once tutored Iemitsu observed the shogun's court. No one dares to attempt any opposition to the will of the shogun. Whatever injustice the shogun may commit or into whatever extravagance of excesses he may plunge, they praise or approve of all. But ruling by fear alone could also breed revolt. Iemitsu had to keep the daimyo lords allegiance, all 260 of them. In peacetime, there was no common enemy, no spoils of war to reward the daimyo for their loyalty. Iemitsu had to find some other way to control the daimyo lords. 
they were commanded to appear at Iemitsu's court in Edo. And they did not journey alone, as witnessed by a German traveler. The bodyguards and bearers put on a swaggering gait when they pass. With every step, they kick up their heels nearly to their backsides, and at the same time thrust the opposite arm forward. It looks as if they're swimming in the air. These elaborate processions often numbered in the thousands. They were part of a system known as alternate attendance. The alternate attendance system had been evolving over the decades of Tokugawa rule. And primarily what it meant is that great lords had to spend part of the year in Edo and part of the year back in their domains. They had to travel back and forth according to strictly set schedules while their wives and children had to spend all their time in Edo. This was the single greatest administrative control on the outer lords during the Tokugawa shogunate. Alternate attendance had another advantage for the shogun. It kept the daimyo lords financially powerless. It was reported that a daimyo could spend more than three quarters of his income maintaining the processions and supporting his army of samurai once they reached Edo. What this also does, by the way, is cause Edo to explode in size. And in fact, there grows up in Edo a class of samurai who only know Edo, even though their domain may be in the farthest reach of Japan. They're born in Edo, they work in Edo, and they only know Edo. For the samurai warrior, life in peacetime Edo was the catalyst that changed the very nature of their existence. Prohibited from bringing their wives and families, the samurai lived a bachelor's life. They were paid a small stipend to perform their official duties, such as they were. They would get up in the morning and have their hair dressed by a fellow samurai. Then they would go to work on the grounds of the Lord's estate. This they would do once every four or five days. These samurai would work only in the morning and then go home for lunch. At around two o'clock in the afternoon, they would go out on the town. It was a life that the once proud warrior could never have imagined. Edo was becoming a city of samurai whose job description was rapidly changing from soldier to bureaucrat. The life of a samurai, they aren't allowed to work, they're given enough money to live on, and mostly what they do is they spend every day at the house of a friend drinking and talking and studying and doing tea and reading books of old war tales and uh, imagining what it would have been like to live in the 1500s. Life in 17th century Japan did not include the hazards of war. Yet peace brought its own perils. Rules and regulations were strict, and the penalties could be severe for any who dared disobey. Fluttering our papers, the spring winds blow, when through the open barriers, how gratefully we go. Five government highways led to the shogun's capital of Edo, all with inspection barriers to enforce Iemitsu's laws. The shogun had improved the road so his messengers could quickly reach any part of Japan.
These roads also made it easier for the daimyo and their samurai warriors to travel to Edo. But for most Japanese, travel was an arduous process. A multitude of rules and regulations monitored who came in and who went out of the city of Edo. Almost everyone needed a passport. The few exceptions included itinerant performers who proved their identity by showing off their talent or sumo wrestlers whose girth was ample proof of their profession. Farmers were routinely denied permission to travel from village to village. The government preferred to keep them working in the fields. Those without the proper papers often tried to avoid the inspection posts by slipping by on side roads. If caught, there were severe penalties. A traditional Japanese-style punishment meant crucifixion for a man, for a woman, enslavement, or enforced servitude. With so many laws and restrictions, one never knew when the shogun's edicts might actually be enforced. Sort of like a theater of punishment to try to scare people into behaving. Some ruler might decide that morals are going to hell in a handbasket and suddenly grab one person and punish them severely. Despite the uncertainty, against all odds, travel grew in popularity. Now that the roads were safer, more and more Japanese began to journey from village to village. The most traveled road was the Tokaido, which ran for 300 miles from Kyoto to Edo. 53 rest stops dotted the highway. And so these post towns along the five great roads of Japan grew up to be very substantial towns themselves. They had inns, they had brothels, they had uh, restaurants, they had places that sold medicine. There essentially grew up a post-town culture. People in the Tokugawa period, they were driven by a curiosity. People were beginning to think about Japan as a nation. Travel diaries became bestsellers. Inoue Tsujo was a young samurai woman writer who kept a diary as she traveled the Tokaido Road. The mountain range rises above the clouds and splashing water gashes over the rocks, making an ear-splitting noise. On the way up, we feel that we are being knocked down backwards. And on the way down, we feel that we are slipping all the way. Thus, we are often fearful. Inns along the way offered welcome respite to travelers like Tsujo. She was on her way to Edo to serve in the residence of a high-ranking samurai. Although Tsujo traveled on official business accompanied by her brother, she still encountered disturbing difficulties. All travelers faced strict regulations, but women had an especially hard time. 
It was very difficult for women to travel in the 17th century. Firstly, because they had to get the permission of the household, who usually thought they would be better cleaning and cooking. And women's travel permits were much more elaborate. Many checkpoints wouldn't permit women to pass because women had to have a thorough inspection. They were body searched, and many checkpoints didn't have female officers to conduct that body search. Officials were always on the lookout for women who disguised themselves as boys. When Sujo arrived at the barrier station, she was ordered to appear before an older woman guard. A rough-looking woman examined me, ran her hand through my hair, and said something with a heavy accent. It was very unpleasant, but I had no choice. I was afraid of what she might do. At another post, she experienced difficulties due to the wording of her permit. When I presented my official document at the barrier, they refused my passage. Because in the permit, I was only identified as a woman, rather than a young woman with long open sleeves. I had to go back to the inn. I was heartbroken. Sujo worried if she would be allowed to continue her journey. It was a sleepless night, as she wrote in her diary. My tears darken the light of a candle. How restless I feel. Everything is depressing beyond description. In the dawn around four o'clock, I heard travelers gathering around and calling each other. A horse neighing and the sounds of stirrups. I feel envious. I have spent days and nights brooding over the obstacles facing women. Sujo's plight was not uncommon. Under Iomitsu's reign, anybody who did not follow his rules could be punished. But there was one group persecuted simply because of their beliefs, the Christians. The shogun Iemitsu offered rewards for the arrest of any Japanese who preached or practiced the Christian faith. Any informer revealing the whereabouts of the followers of priests must be rewarded accordingly. If anyone reveals the whereabouts of a high-ranking priest, he must be given 100 pieces of silver. One has to bear in mind in this period of Japanese history that there was repression and that the Tokugawa authorities, the shogun, wanted to keep Japanese society as it was. And that did lead some people to believe that Christianity was subversive and was upsetting the social framework, the social pattern of Japan. By Iemitsu's time, all foreign missionaries had been deported. But the converts they left behind, the Japanese Christians, remained devout. For many of the Japanese Christians, the faith ran very, very deep indeed, especially in those areas where Christianity had really set down roots for three or four generations. 
the Shogun is a great enemy to the name of Christians. A European merchant observed the growing persecutions. I saw 55 martyred because they would not forsake their Christian faith. And amongst them, there were little children of five or six years old, burned in their mother's arms, crying out, Jesus, receive their souls. I would say the third shogun, Iemitsu, I think became morbidly pathological, pathologically uh, fearful of Christianity. They thought that this was a threat to our power. They put out all the plugs, so to speak, to eradicate Christianity. Christianity was said to be evil, a wicked religion, subversive religion. And so that is why they took such extreme steps to eliminate the religion. Despite the persecutions, Christianity had struck a chord amongst many disaffected Japanese. They grew defiant, even willing to be martyred for their beliefs. I am a Japanese and Jesuit brother. I have not committed any crime but die only for having preached the religion of our Lord Jesus Christ. I greatly rejoice to die for this cause. For me, this is a great blessing. I guarantee and affirm that there is no other way to salvation except by the Christian path. Iemitsu was increasingly disturbed by the Christian situation, especially in the south, where a large number lived. Even worse, many of the Christians were former samurai, now forced to work as laborers or farmers. But they were samurai in their hearts and well-versed in the use of weapons. For Iemitsu, this was unacceptable. The shogun's iron hand extended to every detail of a peasant's life. Farmers must work in the fields from dawn to dusk. Wives and daughters must make meals three times a day, put on red headbands, and take the meals to the fields. Once men are home after dusk, Sisters-in-law and female cousins must put the chap feet of the man on the stomach of his wife and massage them. If the shogun's intolerable edicts weren't bad enough, the farmers were also heavily taxed. There were taxes on windows and shelves, a head tax on each newborn child, and a whole tax to bury the dead. The farmers were taxed in rice, the currency of the day.
Ironically, farmers were not allowed to eat the rice they grew. These taxes were collected by the daimyo to finance their elaborate processions to Edo and to pay the stipends which supported the samurai class. The farmers were in dire straits, as a Japanese writer lamented. Year by year, the farmers grew more exhausted. How could they sustain life itself under those circumstances? In the Shimabara Peninsula in the far south of Japan, drought and famine further depleted the meager harvest. Those who could not pay the taxes were punished severely. In mid-December 1637, a single event ignited the long smoldering fuse. The young daughter of a farmer who owed taxes was seized and tortured. Furious with grief, the father and his friends killed the local governor and the whole village, samurai, peasants and Christians, rose in revolt. Soon the whole area was in the hands of the rebels, nearly 40,000. So what began as a social upheaval, a social revolt against the tremendously harsh taxation against the peasants, leaving the peasants almost starving, what began as that somehow developed into a Christian rebellion. A European merchant reported on the rebellion. A few days after the outbreak, the Christians joined the farmers. They cry out throughout the whole country that the time had now come to revenge the innocent blood of so many Christians and priests and that they are prepared to die for their faith. The rebels swarmed into an abandoned castle surrounded on three sides by the sea. Feeling protected, they brought in their wives and children and barricaded themselves inside. This was very upsetting. The peasants who were the lowest of the low, the poor people, they had no right to rebel. They had, and not only had they rebelled and revolted, but they were doing darned well militarily. And so no wonder the shogun was worried about this because this might set an example to other parts of the country that had become unsatisfied with the crushing taxes which the peasants were paying. The shogun didn't tolerate dissidents, especially any who looked to Jesus for help. He sent his troops to Shimabara to quell the rebellion. But for four bloody months, even as food ran out, the rebels managed to hold off the government attacks. The shogun was so incensed at the continuing rebellion that he asked the Dutch to send a ship with cannons against the besieged castle. The Dutch were reluctant to take part in this campaign, but 
Nevertheless, they desperately wanted to hold on to this toehold which they had in trade with Japan. And so if they didn't obey the order of the shogun, he might well say, well, okay, you can pack up and go home. The shogun ordered the castle set ablaze. Still, the rebels fought back. But in the end, their fate was sealed. And the castle fell finally through starvation and then followed a dreadful slaughter. And that was the last battle, really, in Japanese history. The Shimabara Rebellion was the excuse the Shogun needed to finally eradicate Christianity from Japan. The Shogun decided draconian measures. We will cut off Japan from all Christian influence. Now, how can you do that? We will isolate Japan. These foreigners, of course, so much trouble, I suppose he was thinking. They are an, un an unnecessary complication to our life. So why not try to preserve Japanese society as is now. We don't want changes. The third shogun issued laws restricting travel outside of the country. On penalty of death, no Japanese could leave Japan, and those who were already abroad could not return. To ensure his edicts were obeyed, he destroyed all ships of seagoing capacity. Then he forbade the entry of any ship of European origin. Only the Dutch were allowed to stay and trade, but with severe restrictions. The maritime restrictions are designed to prevent any unauthorized contact with the outside world. They're designed to control trade, and they're designed to prevent um, Christian missionaries from reaching Japan and being able to proselytize. And, and they form uh, the bedrock of Tokugawa foreign policy for the life of the shogunate, which is sometimes called the beginning of the isolation of Japan. Two years later, in defiance of the shogun's ban, an official Portuguese trade delegation arrived in Japan. The shogun showed no mercy and ordered the execution of 57 of those aboard, ambassadors and their crew. He ordered the ship burned. The few survivors were sent back with this warning. A similar penalty will be suffered by all who come to these shores from Portugal, whether they be ambassadors or sailors, whether they come by error or driven by storm. Even more, if the king of Portugal, or even the god of the Christians were to come, they would all pay the very same penalty. The doors of Japan clanged shut, and were not opened again to the west for 200 years. The will of the shogun had prevailed. But many wondered how this isolated empire would survive in a rapidly changing world.
Early on the morning of July 2nd, 1853, a Japanese fisherman reported a strange sight. I was told there were ships on fire. I ran up the mountain to get a good look. The ships came nearer and nearer until the shape of them showed us they were not Japanese ships, but foreign. And what we had taken for a conflagration on sea was really the black smoke rising out of their smokestacks. Steamships, like most Western innovations, were unknown in Japan. Now there were four in the harbor. The American squadron, armed with cannons and almost a thousand men, was ready to force its way onto Japanese shores. Japan was a land shrouded in mystery, a warrior society ruled by the powerful Tokugawa shogunate. They had successfully kept the West at bay for over 200 years. But now the Western powers demanded entry. Could the samurai nation repel the industrial might of a determined West? These are the memoirs of Japan's secret empire. who are in contact with us are bound by an oath and signed with their blood not to talk or entrust to us information about the situation of their country, their religion, and secrets of government. So reported the German doctor Engelbert Kempfer, one of the few Europeans allowed in Japan. It was the year 1690, and the Japanese viewed Westerners as barbarians who threatened their orderly society the Japanese were determined to keep their doors closed to the West for as long as they could. There was one exception, a small settlement of Dutch traders who agreed to live in confinement on an island in Nagasaki Harbor. For over 200 years, this sequestered trading post would be Europe's only window to this impenetrable land. The Dutch East Indies Company sent Dr. Kempfer to provide medical care for the Dutch community. He was also asked to gather information about the everyday life of the Japanese. It would not be an easy task. We are strictly and strongly guarded from the inside and the outside by various guards treating us not like honest men, but like criminals, traitors, spies, prisoners or to say the least, hostages of the Shogun. This jail goes by the name of Dejima. The Dutch lived like prisoners on Dejima. But Kempfer was fascinated by the opportunity to write about something and nobody else uh, could get access to. Dejima was tiny. Kempfer counted 236 steps across and 82 wide. There were never more than 19 men allowed on the island at a time, and never any Western women. Far from home, the men did what they could to transform the unfamiliar Japanese-style buildings into a little touch of Holland. They placed chairs and high tables on the woven grass mats, replaced futons with poster beds, and insisted on being served Dutch food rather than eating Japanese. No Japanese, except for prostitutes, were allowed unsupervised contact with the Dutch. Yet, in order to gather information for his reports, Kempfer managed to create a small group of inadvertent Japanese informants. 
I served them willingly and without charge in my profession with medicines, while cordially serving them European liqueurs. I questioned them about local matters, nature and secular and spiritual topics with total freedom. The Japanese were as inquisitive as Kempfer. The Dutch settlement was their window to the exotic world of the West. But the trickle of information that arrived from overseas was carefully guarded. Every time a uh, Dutch ship arrived, the Dutch ship would have the latest news from Europe, and that news would be given to the Dutch authorities in Nagasaki, and then that news would be translated into Japanese and rushed immediately to the headquarters of the Shogun. The ruler of Japan, the Shogun, hungered for news of the outside world. He commanded the Westerners to present themselves at his castle once a year. The only time Kempfer really saw Japan was when he traveled from Nakazaki to Edo, which was the Shogun's capital. The road trip to Edo gave Kempfer revealing glimpses into the world of the Japanese. He recorded every detail of his month-long trip. We received many of the honors that are generally shown to the provincial lords. The roads are swept with brooms and water to keep the dust down. In the houses bordering the road, people kneel behind the blinds, watching our procession in profound silence. An incredible number of people daily use the highways of Japan's provinces. Indeed, at certain times of the year, they are as crowded as the streets of a populous European city. The reason for these crowds is partly that the Japanese travel more often than other people. Kempfer would write about all of the travelers, samurai and their lords called daimyo, merchants and roadside performers, Buddhist monks, and a group of young women who dressed like nuns. They cover their shorn heads with silk hoods and adorn themselves nicely. Each attaches herself to one particular traveler, starts up a rustic tune, and as long as it's to her advantage, she accompanies and amuses him for several hours. As the road traffic grew, so did the number of merchants who catered to the travelers' needs. We saw many fine stalls, those of merchants and cloth dealers, medicine dealers, traders in idols, booksellers, glassblowers, pharmacists, and, and people crying out their wares. There are countless humble inns, roadside food stalls, sake or beer taverns, uh, cake and sweet stalls along our road. Outside tables also have a variety of biscuits of different colors and shapes on display. They are pretty to look at, but are generally so tough that it is difficult to move one's teeth if one attempts to chew them. Tradesmen, once considered social parasites, were beginning to improve their position in Japanese society. Successful street peddlers became roadside merchants, who would eventually build bigger stores and even move to the cities. Kempfer was witnessing a changing way of life in Japan that would soon shake the very foundations of this highly ordered society. The samurai weren't allowed to engage in trade, so the merchant's standard of living was rising while that of the samurai was falling, and that was just not appropriate for Tokugawa society where the samurai were the top class. 
The samurai were the elite ruling class, less than 10% of the population. In Tokugawa, Japan, one was born a samurai. And only a samurai had the right to carry two swords. Obligation and loyalty to one's daimyo master formed the basis of their warrior code. But now, in an era of peace, the once privileged samurai faced an uncertain future. There were no wars to fight, and many daimyo found it difficult to keep a full army on staff. While higher-level samurai could find work as civil servants, other samurai were not allowed to work in occupations considered beneath their class. An increasing number of unemployed samurai, called ronin, wandered the countryside looking for a new master. The search for new opportunities led many to the cities. And there was no more rapidly growing city than Edo, later to be known as Tokyo. Edo was the capital of the Tokugawa shogunate and Dr. Kempfer's destination. Here he would finally come face to face with the shogun, the most powerful person in Japan. When Dr. Kempfer arrived in Edo, he was sequestered in guarded quarters for two weeks. Finally, he was summoned to appear at the castle of the fifth shogun, Tokugawa Tsunayoshi. The shogun's residence is spacious with many long corridors and large rooms, which can be closed off by sliding partitions. According to the finest design of Japanese traditions, with ceilings, beams, and pillars, patterned by nature, covered with lacquer, or carved and gilded artistically into patterns of birds and foliage. The important thing about the fifth Tokugawa shogun Tsunayoshi was that he was the first shogun who was not educated as a samurai. Uh, he was educated as a scholar because he was never supposed to become shogun. And so he had a, quite a different view of the world. The shogun's mother was a merchant's daughter. She broke class barriers when she caught the eye of the reigning shogun. Her son, Tsunayoshi, carried within him both samurai and merchant values. He would preside over a new direction in Japanese society. At his court, scholarship rather than martial prowess was the fashion, and daimyo lords who wished to curry favor with him became patrons of the arts and letters. It was a time of cultural flowering in Japan. Tsunayoshi changed samurai society. He condemned violence, which of course was part of the samurai ethic. Influenced by his childhood study of Buddhism and the Confucian classics, the shogun's laws of compassion were intended to protect all of nature's creatures. Tsunayoshi's laws of compassion protected those at the bottom of the social scale. He had laws against infanticide, and that is quite advanced. Uh, children were abandoned when parents couldn't no longer feed them. They were simply left to die. But Tsunayoshi ordered that from now on, officials had to take care of them, feed them, and find homes for them. But Tsunayoshi was also known for lavishing the national treasury on his own pleasures, and he began to pursue his reforms to harsh and unpopular extremes. Born in the year of the dog, Tsunayoshi issued strict laws protecting dogs. The samurai kept large number of dogs in their mansions, 
And uh, those who were not wanted were let go and roamed the city and often attacked uh, children. <laughs> Nobody wanted to be responsible for a dog, but he of course could not order that these dogs be killed. He ended up building dog pounds and apparently there were eventually some 40,000 dogs which were fed in dog pounds. And of course the feudal lord, Sadamio, had to pay for that. Tsunayoshi would become known as the dog shogun. Dr. Kempfer observed with humor. When dogs die, they are carried up the mountains and buried no less carefully than people. A certain farmer laboriously carrying his dead dog up the hill complained to his neighbor about the year of the birth of the shogun. The other replied, my friend, let us not complain. If he was born in the year of the horse, our load would be much heavier. It was the dog shogun who Dr. Kempfer was finally summoned to meet. After a month-long trip and two weeks of waiting, Kempfer was so impressed with the experience, he drew sketches to illustrate his account of the command performance. After we had been drilled for two hours, he ordered us to take off our cloaks, to dance, to jump, to play the drunkard, to speak broken Japanese, to sing. At the demand of the shogun, we had to put up with providing such amusements and perform innumerable other monkey tricks. Engelbert Kempfer and the fifth shogun shared one thing, and that was a great curiosity. But at the audience, the shogun sat behind a bamboo screen. And he asked Kempfer to come close to the bamboo screen, even take his wig off and dance and sing for him. And Kempfer strained his eyes to be able to see what the shogun looked like and his wife's behind the bamboo screen. But they never were able to talk to each other directly. The shogun and the doctor would meet only three times, but each provided a brief glimpse for the other into his world. Kempfer's account of Japan became a bestseller. It first appeared in English, then it was translated into Dutch, French, several translations, even Russian. And basically, all knowledge until the 20th century was based on Kempfer's so-called history of Japan. Japan had no desire to open its doors to the West. The country was at peace but the economy was in decline. Thousands of disenfranchised samurai warriors would keep the nation on edge. By the beginning of the 18th century, Edo was probably the largest city in the world, with over a million people. Unlike the European capitals, its citizens enjoyed a safe, clean city with an advanced recycling program. And it was prosperous beyond measure. Copper coins flow like currents of water, while silver piles up like drifting snow. Every morning, fish are sold in such quantities that one may well wonder whether or not the supply in the seas has been exhausted. Visible in the distance is Mount Fuji rising in all its magnificence against the horizon. At least half of Edo's population were samurai warriors who had come to the capital with their daimyo lords. Since there were no wars to fight, the samurai had leisure time, but not always the means to enjoy it. The downside of the era of peace for samurai was that the samurai weren't allowed to engage in commerce and therefore gradually 
they see a lot of wealthy merchants more able to do all of the things that they want to do uh, because they have more money than your common samurai. Ironically, merchants who catered to the needs of the samurai were the ones who benefited. They could now afford to get education, develop their taste, cultural taste, and uh, emulate the high-class samurai whom uh, these merchants always admired and envied. The social barrier was breaking down. Since the beginning of the Tokugawa era, a restrictive class structure had kept everyone in their place. Although the classes were not supposed to fraternize, the rules began to bend. In social situations, such as the popular haiku clubs, where both samurai and merchants were both active participants, rather than addressing each other by their acknowledged family names, each would create a pen name. In this way, they freed themselves from adhering to the rigid rules demanded by their social standing. Encouraged by peace and a prosperous economy, the arts and entertainment flourished. Samurai interest in education had encouraged literacy among all social groups. 85% of the male population of Edo were avid readers. In 1800, there are about 120 or more haiku poetry circles. And also there are about 500 bookstores and very active publishing activities. The people demanded these books and information. They want to read exciting fictions. Some of the best-selling novels of the day were written by a merchant turned author named Ihara Saikaku. His books celebrated the era's emerging pop culture, a totally new genre in Japanese fiction. Saikaku haunted the streets of Edo for his literary material. He knew prostitutes and daimyo, as well as beggars and merchants. And he wrote about them all with unabashed candor and ribald humor, especially the newly prosperous merchants who tried to emulate the refined samurai. If you didn't know better, you'd think they all came from fine families. But let me tell you, that one in the shiny coat, he's a glue maker. He deals in cattle bones and cow slobber. But the way he dresses, you'd think his own bones were the product of fine breeding. He's had to put his house in hock. His creditors have taken him to court. If you ask me, he's crazy to be out for a night on the town. In Edo, a night on the town often meant kabuki, the most popular form of stage entertainment. To Edo people, the kabuki actors were like Hollywood stars. The fans would collect woodblock prints of their favorite actors, not only for the fun of collecting them, but also to see what fantastic costumes their favorite actors were wearing on stage. If the fans really liked a certain style or design, in a flash, it would become the newest fashion trend. The kabuki plays were romantic, heroic tales. One of the most famous, Tushingura, was based on a notorious real-life event. A daimyo lord had been humiliated in a confrontation with a court official. The ruling shogun had ordered the lord to commit seppuku, ceremonial suicide. Outraged by his death, 47 of the lord's samurai warriors avenged his honor by killing the official. This presented the ruling shogun with a dilemma. The samurai had obeyed their code of honor, yet they had challenged the shogun's authority. The people begged for clemency, but the shogun would not yield. He ordered the samurai to commit suicide. These samurai had lived and died by their own code of honor.
The incident captured the public's attention like no other. Soon these men were immortalized on the Kabuki stage, a nostalgic tribute to a bygone era. It represented for them the ideal that samurai were so selfless and devoted to honor and to their lord that they would give up their lives. And this was reassuring uh, to them in a messy, commercialistic world in which most samurai spent their time drinking and partying and watching the theater and being selfish like us. Here there are 47 samurai really act like warriors. All raise a shout of acclaim, well done, well done. And this praise will be echoed through ages to come for these loyal retainers. We have recorded here their glory, ever renewed like the leaves of the bamboo. The honor of the samurai would live on in myth and legend. But in Tokugawa, Japan, there were no wars. No more quests for eternal glory. In real life, the samurai would have to find another outlet for their passion. The courtesan arranges her clothing so that the red silk undergarment will flip open to reveal a flash of white skin. When men witness such a sight, they go insane and spend the money they are entrusted with, even if it means literally losing their heads the next day. But most men only gape envious of the men who can pay the courtesan's price. More than 3,000 courtesans and geisha plied their trade in Yoshiwara, the pleasure district of Edo. Yoshiwara was government regulated, an effective tool for keeping the restless male population under careful control. Like soldiers on perpetual leave, the samurai often spent their idle hours and squandered their meager stipends on its seductive illusions. Yoshiwara was a dreamland for Edo men. It gave them fantasy, imagination, and romance. It was like a Hollywood, where celebrity was so important. Gated, walled, and surrounded by a moat, it was a city unto itself. No Westerner was ever allowed to explore its pleasures. There was a distinct difference between the geisha and the courtesans. Geisha were professional entertainers. They did not rely on sex, uh, for entertaining men. They had their music, their singing, playing musical instruments and dancing. Uh, whereas the courtesans uh, entertained the clients with a conversation and uh, sexual gratifications. Yoshiwara courtesans were the elite of the prostitutes. If they just wanted to fulfill their sexual need, all over Edo, there were plenty of illegal, cheap prostitutes. Uh, but they wanted to come to Yoshiwara because it was such a prestigious and special place. Recruited at a young age from impoverished families, both geishas and courtesans were schooled in fastidious etiquette and endowed with a magnificent sense of style and artistic refinement. Their ability to hold a conversation about the latest play or city scandal was as important as what came afterwards. The courtesans and their clients gathered in neighboring tea houses. They were stylish centers of elegance and wit, much like the London coffee houses of the same period. To properly partake of Yoshiwara's delights was an art in itself.
And the Yoshiwara courtesans were trained to think that they were better than their clients. And uh, if a man wanted to visit the Yoshiwara, he had to prepare for it six months in prior. He had to buy a fine set of sword. He had to think about what to wear because he wouldn't just go there. The courtesan had the right to turn down her client if she didn't like him, even if he could afford to pay for her. Therefore, he wanted to make a good impression on the courtesan. And then, once he's committed to her, he had no right to see other women. And if he, uh, on the sly, went to see any other person, uh, the co courtesan's entourage had every right to punish him. His hair would cut off, he would be made to wear woman's red kimono, and he would be taunted by everyone. Yoshiwara nurtured its own unique customs, art, fashion, and language. It was a world seemingly set adrift from the harsh realities of life. Living only for the moment, giving all our time to the pleasures of the moon, the snow, cherry blossoms, and maple leaves. Singing songs, drinking sake, caressing each other, just drifting, drifting. Never give a care if we had no money, refusing to be disheartened, like a gourd floating along the river current. This is what is called ukiyo, the floating world. But the word ukiyo uh, still retained its Buddhistic sense of this transitory life. It's, in, the, its impermanence, this life's suffering, was still there, particularly for the courtesans and prostitutes, all of whom had some kind of trouble. They were very unhappy, and yet they had to present a very brilliant, gay, um, uh, external appearance to the uh, general public. It makes me think of the... Uh, music of blues in the jazz world, this indefinable, indescribable pathos, sadness, and languidness. Um, this is very reminiscent of uh, the word ukiyo to me. For the samurai who frequented Yoshiwara, times were changing. They continued to train daily for battle, but without a war to fight, many became aimless. Today's warriors, all they talk about is women eating and drinking, actors and dramatic productions. Their fencing practice and lance work are only for personal vendetta. Their study of archery and gunnery are solely for show. They're riding just for ceremonies. Katsu Kokichi was a mid-level samurai drawn to Yoshiwara, but without the income to fulfill his desires. I was 21 and penniless. I had no choice but to sell my everyday sword. I had only the clothes on my back. To take my mind off my woes, I went to the Yoshiwara. They are protesting youngsters that did not fit into the society, wearing oversized kimonos with interesting hairstyles, sometimes skinhead, as well protest. Many of these young men, unemployed and desperate like Katsu Kokichi, lived on the edge of society, often falling into debt, theft, and gangsterism. When we entered the shrine precinct, a couple of sharp-looking characters sauntered up to us, humming a tune. Without warning, my body spat in the face of one of the men. Ah! Ah! 
We then noticed a group of about 20 men, all armed with long hooked spears. Outside the gates was a reinforcement of some 30 men with pike poles. We were four against 50. For Katsu Kokichi, the samurai code of honor was all but gone. By the middle of the 18th century, the expensive delights of Yoshiwara were no longer affordable for most samurai. The pleasure district took on an increasingly ugly edge. And the brothel keepers lost their pride. They had become slaves of uh, money making and uh, they became much less compassionate. Some of them became very, very cruel and treated uh, prostitutes miserably, and there were some deaths. Toward the end of the period, the sick uh, prostitutes were not given uh, medication or care, and when they died, they were just thrown into a pit uh, for nameless dead. <laughs> Feeling alone, just like floating weeds cut off at the root, I may just follow where the water may take me. The insular world of the samurai was in decay. To find a cure for its ills, some would begin to look in an unlikely direction. The West now beckoned with new ideas and hope. I couldn't read a word, of course, but drawings of the viscera, bones, and muscles were quite unlike anything I had previously seen. Physician Sugita Genpaku couldn't read Dutch, but when he stumbled upon a Dutch anatomy book, he was stunned by the drawings. He had never seen anything like it in his Chinese medical books. In the mid-18th century, Western books, first brought clandestinely from the Netherlands, piqued the interest of many Japanese scientists and doctors. Sugita Genpaku received permission from the government to order the first sanctioned autopsy of a criminal's corpse for scientific study. The corpse of the criminal was that of an old woman of about 50 years. The old butcher pointed to this and that, giving them names, but there were certain parts for which he had no names. When we compared what we saw with the illustrations in the Dutch book, it was exactly as depicted. Dr. Sugita and his friends reflected on how shameful it was that they had tried to treat their patients without a true knowledge of the human body. He vowed to learn more. He taught himself Dutch so he could translate the book. The next day, we met and began. Gradually, we got so we could decipher 10 lines or more a day. After two or three years of hard study, everything became clear to us. The joy of it was as the chewing of sweet sugar cane. In 1774, the shogun granted Dr. Sugita permission to publish the medical book so he could share his knowledge with other doctors. This book became part of a growing interest in Dutch learning, known as Rangaku. Originally, Rangaku had to do with medical studies. 
When physicians discovered they could heal ailments with the new Western medicine from Holland that they couldn't heal with the traditional Japanese medical practices, they became very interested in the study of Rangaku. Gradually, as knowledge of the Dutch language became more widespread, other aspects of Rangaku, such as astronomy, science, and chemistry, were introduced to Japan. Almost a hundred years after Dr. Engelbert Kempfer, the desire for Western knowledge would initiate the push to open the door to Japan from the inside. And yet, as attractive as Western knowledge was to some Japanese intellectuals, there were others who believed that anything Western still threatened Japanese society. One source of harm that has appeared of late is Dutch studies. These students have been taken in by the weakness of some for novel gadgets and rare medicines which delight the eye and enthrall the heart. If someday, the treacherous foreigner should take advantage of the situation and lure ignorant people to his ways, our people will adopt such practices as eating dogs and sheep, and no one will be able to stop it. It is like nurturing barbarians within our own country. Today, the alien barbarians of the West the lowly organs of the legs and feet of the world are dashing across the seas, tramping other countries underfoot, and daring with their squinting eyes and limping feet to override the noble nations. What manner of arrogance is this? Japan had managed to keep the alien barbarians at bay for more than 200 years. But now, in the mid-19th century, the West was poised to assert itself. The Shogun is faced with a strategic threat on three fronts. From the north, the Russians are coming. From the south, the British are coming. And ultimately, from the east, the Americans come. The new country of the United States of America was on the move. Japan was known to have large coal deposits and something else in abundance. Whales. Whale oil, which literally greased the wheels of American industry, was a multi-million dollar business. Whale hunters had depleted the North Atlantic Oceans. Now America looked eastward to Japan. If that double-bolted land Japan is ever to become hospitable, it is the whale ship alone to whom the credit will be due. So wrote Herman Melville in his classic tale of the great white whale that haunted the waters off Japan. By the time Moby Dick was published in 1851, the United States was ready to assert its power. Japan's leaders were aware of the growing push towards their shores. The shogunate had been preparing for the arrival of the West for decades. They had set up a special translation bureau, which was gathering information about the West, translating atlases, translating dictionaries, developing a set of foreign affairs specialists. Key advisors warned of an imminent foreign threat. They urged the shogun to bolster his defenses. We should build warships. Then if barbarians come to our sea, we should shoot every single one of them. Others feared that Japan could not serve as a worthy opponent to the West. Their weaponry and ships had not changed since closing the doors to Europe 200 years before. There was no resolution. Then, early in the morning on July 2nd, 1853, a local fisherman reported this strange sight. I was told there were ships on fire. I ran up to the mountain to get a good look. The ships came nearer and nearer. 
until the shape of them showed us they were not Japanese ships, but foreign. And what we had taken for a conflagration on sea was really the black smoke rising out of the smokestacks. These steamships dwarfed any ship ever built in Japan. To the Japanese, they were the Kurofune, the black ships of evil appearance. On board were some 60 cannons and almost 1,000 Americans. And they landed not in the foreigner's port of Nagasaki, but rather in the forbidden waters of Edo Bay, the shogun's own capital city. Upon hearing the news, the shogun immediately fell ill. Many said from the shock of hearing that a foreign naval squadron was at his doorstep. His advisors tried to deal with the crisis. Fresh messages arrived one after the other. The situation seemed so sudden, so formidable, and so important. Orders were issued to the great clans to keep strict watch, as if it were possible that these barbarian vessels might proceed to acts of violence. In a desperate show of force, the shogunate sent a squadron of guard boats to surround the American ships. The Japanese officer ordered the ships to leave. Their commander, Commodore Matthew C. Perry, ignored him. I was well aware that the more exclusive I should make myself, and the more exacting I might be, the more respect these people of forms and ceremonies would award me. 5,000 samurai warriors armed with swords and antiquated cannons lined the shores. Again, their chief officer commanded Perry, leave Edo Bay immediately. The Commodore refused. I endeavor to inculcate the idea that the government of the United States is superior in power and influence to Japan. The honor of the nation calls for it, and the interest of commerce demands it. The Japanese on shore watched as Perry's crews readied for action. Cannons were loaded, guns were drawn. Perry came ashore. Perry presented his papers and delivered his ultimatum. He would be back and he expected Japan to comply with America's demand to open the country for trade. If not, he was prepared to take Japan by force. He would return in the spring for his answer. Then he and his squadron left Edo Bay. Their deportment and manner of expressions were exceedingly arrogant, and the resulting insult to our national dignity was not small. Those who heard could but gnash their teeth and suffer this insult in silence. After the barbarians had retired, a certain person drew his sword and slashed to bits a portrait of their leader, Perry. There was great fear of Perry. There were uh, the, the portraits of Perry as a devil. There were the portraits of his ships belching fire. All of this served to, to whip up you know, near hysteria on the part of, of portions of the Japanese populace. At the same time, there's fascination. There's fascination with Perry. There's fascination with these ships, these enormous ships that hadn't been seen before. There's fascination with the technological prowess of the Americans. To complicate matters, the shogun had died, and the new shogun was mentally unfit. His advisors took charge, but they could not reach agreement. The head of the shogunate decides that he is going to poll all of the daimyo in Japan. What should the shogunate do? Uh, this is a radical break with tradition. The, the authority of the shogunate is to deal with foreign relations. The title of the shogun, of course, is the great barbarian quelling generalissimo. And yet here is the head of the shogunate asking the daimyo what he should do. Two positions are staked out. One, 
being known as the open the country argument. The Americans do not understand the ethics of humanity and justice. There will be no choice but to start trade with them. The other side being revere the emperor and expel the barbarian. The Americans have come to seize Japan. Therefore, if we don't drive them away now, the other foreign powers will follow. We are in a dangerous situation. While the debate raged, the shogunate remained indecisive. The end of the year was filled with half-hearted compromises and inadequate attempts at coastal defense. Then, in February, Perry returned earlier than expected. This time, his show of force was even more ominous. He arrived with double the ships and crew. The honor of the Japanese had been challenged, but they had no means to defend it. Their only hope lay in negotiation. As soon as Perry came ashore, the talks began. They went on into the night and for the next 23 days. In the end, the treaty was a compromise, which served both countries' interests. Perry got what he wanted which was to establish a relationship between Japan and the United States. The shogunate got what it wanted in not surrendering its control over foreign relations and opening Japan up to unregulated trade. I'm not sure that the shogunate has been given enough credit for choosing peace over war. And you can say that the, that the shogunate chose to open up relations with America and the West out of weakness, but it didn't have to the shogunate took the practical decision and they chose peace and thereby preserved the integrity and territorial sovereignty of their country. Before signing the treaty with Perry, the shogun arranged a social evening, a prerequisite for conducting business in Japan that continues to this day. Sumo wrestlers displayed their strength. The first one invited Perry to punch him in the stomach. Another wrestler hoisted two huge bags of rice over his head to show his strength. Perry offered champagne and whiskey. He gave the Japanese gifts. Among those of particular interest, a telegraph, a camera, and a quarter-scale steam railroad, unlike anything the Japanese had ever seen. Japanese engineers would quickly make plans to replicate them. Three days later, the agreement was signed. It was not long before Japan signed trade agreements with Russia, England, France, and Holland. Despite its accommodation to the West, the days of the Tokugawa dynasty were numbered. No longer was the warrior class to control the destiny of Japanese society. Within 10 years, the samurai were officially disbanded. But the samurai ethic had been indelibly engraved into Japanese culture. In 1868, the 15th shogun stepped down. With his departure, 265 years of rule by the Tokugawa family had come to an end. The modern era of Japan had begun.